okay? People say out of the ground. Okay, didn't it come out? It's basically solidified carbon dioxide. Okay, and this, this is the headspace they've got to get to. Now, the interesting thing, so the process of photosynthesis, you bring carbon dioxide in, you bring water in, you mix them together, spit the oxygen off, and you've got a... a um, the C6H4, so they've got the um, glucose or a sugar which starts the carbohydrate process. So that's really simple chemistry, okay? And that's where trees from, that's where forests are. Now the fascinating thing is that with a, with a tree, all the action happens above ground, with a grassland that happens below ground, okay? And that photo there is the reason why a healthy perennial pasture can contain more carbon per hectare than a tropical rainforest. Now this is a soil carbon side of it. All right, now when you start to get those headspaces together and you look at, we've got degraded land, but if we restored it, how much carbon could we put back in? That's where the opportunities come. The methane net parts of it become, they drop out of the equation pretty rapidly, okay? Some recognition and reality on this. Now, um, to give you some context, probably started four or five years ago, the New South Wales government has got a thing called a green, or had a greenhouse gas abatement scheme. That greenhouse gas abatement scheme was the first carbon trading scheme on the planet. Okay, it was the first one, it was before the European scheme. Now, uh, we had a meeting with them on the 13th of December 2006. Okay, so there's the questions with the science and how things are happening and how it's developing. At that presentation to his expert advisory panel, they'd never heard the word soil carbon before. Okay, so this is the world's first carbon trading scheme, the government's expert advisory panel, and they'd never heard soil carbon. So when I look at where the conversation is now, and you people may get depressed and a little bit frustrated, I just simply say where it's come from in the three years, and it's just stunning. Okay? From a science point of view, um, any soil scientist, soil scientist, soil science, pure soil science was probably the least sexy science out there. Okay, it's measuring soil. Okay. Why do we know with forests? We know with forests because people have been work wanting to know how fast they grow for years so we can cut them down to make them into timber. So there's been a market imperative for all the research on science for, for um, forests which has been completely lacking for soils. <coughs> Things like the methane side of it, the questions around the methane science, there's lacking in that because up until now it was simply a, is it a little bit more efficient or not? Now it becomes an imperative for climate change. So these guys, the scientists who are here, are playing catch up at a hell of a rate because there was no commercial imperative five years ago and that commercial imperative is there now. So looking at this, this is from the IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. Okay, carbon sequestration in agricultural soils has a mitigation potential. Now, adaptation, which is this forum, is how do we deal with what happens. Mitigation is how do we try to stop it happening. Okay, so a mitigation potential of one to four billion tonnes per annum. Um, this represents between 11 and 17 per cent. Carbon stock in soils is high, highly correlated with productivity and resilience. The interesting point from a political point of view, okay, is that 70 per cent of mitigation potential is in developing regions. This potential was neglected under the Kyoto Agreement, okay, and the other, because that wasn't included, the other 30 per cent is not explored since very few parties selected it. So, soil carbon is actually included under the Kyoto Protocol. People say it's not. It is, in, it is in the Kyoto Protocol. It was an opt-in category. People had to tick it if they wanted to include it or not. But it is provided for under the Kyoto Protocol. Finally, potential of mitigation of livestock emissions may have been underestimated, especially for grazing systems in warm regions. So there is an awareness, even at the top levels, that the numbers they've been using are probably wrong. Okay? Um, this is from the UNFCCC. Okay? And what they're saying here is a highly technical mitigation potential. Um, soil carbon sequestration, cropland and grazing land and restoration of the degraded lands represents 89% of the capacity they see. Okay, so some methane reductions they're talking about, but the big chunk of it they're saying is from soil carbon. So what you've got is you've got, you've got the policy makers at the top level are recognising that carbon and specifically change grazing management has got huge capacity. Okay, so don't get depressed about this thing, don't get frustrated about this thing. It is a formative process but the language is starting to shift global very strongly. Okay. Really simple stuff. Okay. In nature, how do we know there's more carbon? Forgetting the actual measurement bit, how do we know there's more carbon in one bit than another bit? This is a bit interactive team, so... Yes? Yep, what else? Yep. More life, more green growing stuff. It's really simple. Okay, so this is, this is, you've got to get people's head around it. Um, I had a meeting with the European Union and their soil science section. 
And the fascinating bit was, um, it was alluded to before, because they're so focused in on themselves and on their cropping and they're such a heavily populated area, they completely forgot around about the grazing lands. Okay? And they make it too complicated. Once you start to get this message through, they go, oh yeah, we can do that. Okay? So, let's have a look at a couple of things. Where's that? Here. Here? Where else? Where could that be? Could be Africa? Yeah, could be Africa. Okay. Where's that? Okay, the whole lot of places. Where's that? All, right, all the same sort of places, aren't they? Okay. Question, why do they look like that? What's the standard answer from people in the cities why they look... These are farming properties. Okay, why do they look like that? Sheep, overgrazing, too many stock, too many this. Whatever it is, okay, we've got the same thing. What's the answer given for people in the bush? Why do they look like that? Drought. Okay. So there's two different sides of the same thing. Okay. What have I told you that that was next door about a half a mile away? That that was further down the same creek about a half a mile? And that was less than a mile away? Okay, on the same day. The top one is the Sonora Desert, Mexico. Okay, the next one is Date Creek, Arizona. And the bottom one is a property in Zimbabwe. Okay, they are next to each other. They are the same day. There is no fertiliser, there is no chemicals, there is no seeding, there is no mechanical intervention. There is a change in the way the animals are managed. Okay. The interesting thing is that the properties that were on the right on those photos actually have more livestock in total and per hectare than the properties that were undergrazed. So in terms of the vision I have for the future, it is an increase in the number of managed ruminant animals, not a decrease. Okay, possibly a doubling of the number of animals we have on the planet at this stage. Okay, with change management and regenerating massive amounts of the landscape. Okay, it's the only thing that can do things at the level we need to address climate change, whatever the cause is, with all the other benefits that come through from it. Okay? Now that's okay, so we've got Arizona and we've got Zimbabwe and we've got um, Mexico, what about Australia? This is a mate's property down in um, Grenfell. Okay, now he was a banking character who had spent 30 years in Melbourne with his way up the bank and the property, family property, had been under good conventional management. Okay, so he's come back onto it and he's decided to do a few things differently. That's February 2007. That's the same spot, December 2008. It wasn't two boomer years, they were two little bit less than average years. He didn't completely destock, he actually ran more animals on the property, he just changed the way he did it. Okay, so he's gone from those two changes. Um, we're talking about adaptation, we're talking about being able to cope with changes in, in what we expect the climate to be. And as Bob's alluded to, what do we expect to have? Well, it's been, um, we're already, in, as Mike said right at the start, we're in 90% rainfall variability out in this country. We're expecting an increase in rainfall variability. There'll be changes, it might even be the same rainfall, but it'll be more intense. And it'll be great, so there'll be heavier rains, there'll be more, longer periods between the rainfall, and there'll also be um, an increase in temperature. So in those situations, you need to have land that is resilient that can recover quickly. Okay? So the next one is friends who'd done change grazing management. Okay, they hadn't de-stopped. They were running the same number of animals as what the neighbours were. They were doing it differently. This is the first rains that came through at the end of a drought. Can anyone pick the edges of their property? Okay? This was just a coincidence because they were flying a guy in and looked out the window and went, holy hell. Okay? So that is what can happen. Right, why seasonally dry grasslands? The factors that are interesting in seasonally dry grasslands is um, not so much rainfall, it's a different concept I'd like to talk to you about, is a thing called brittleness. Has anyone heard of the term brittleness? Okay, uh, yeah. So brittleness is, is not so much the rainfall itself, it's a, it's a factor of the evenness of distribution of humidity throughout the year in the environment. So at one end you've got something like a tropical rainforest where it's always humid. Okay, it's moist every single day. At the other extreme, you've got a true desert. And in between, you've got a range of different ecosystems. Now, the, critical, the reason this is critical is that this is all a cycle. And I want to talk more about the carbon cycles than that. But in terms of cycling, what is it that actually cycles carbon? Okay, what cycles carbon is normally the microbes and the bacteria, little tiny things. Okay, so in a cow's room, and it's the bacteria that do the work. It's not the cow, she chews it up a bit and then it cycles. So in that moist environment, what you've got is if a big tree falls down in the Amazon rainforest, two years later, you can't find where the tree was because it all decomposes. If a tree falls down out here, okay, you can go out onto your property and see the tree, the, the stump that granddad chopped down. It doesn't decompose.